All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first webinar for the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas Project. I'm really excited that you guys will be joining us and together we'll be learning about bumblebees of the Southeast, bumblebee ecology, and how to participate um, in this project. Um, and this webinar is intended to be a kind of nuts and bolts um, coverage of how to get involved uh, with this project and also some context for why we are doing this project. Um, my name is Lori Heyman. I am an endangered species conservation biologist with the Xerces Society. Um, I'm speaking to you from Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and the other faces that we have on the call are Gabriella Garrison, who is a Eastern Piedmont Habitat Conservation Coordinator with the uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Division, and a big reason why we've been able to launch this project in the Southeast. Um, and also uh, Rich Hatfield, the senior um, conservation biologist um, and, and head of these Atlas projects. Um, some technology, uh, logistical stuff up front. Um, we would encourage you if you have a question to please pop it into the Q&A instead of the chat. The Q&A is the section that mostly Rich will be actively monitoring to answer your questions in the inside the Q&A, literally typing them out as we go. You're welcome to use the chat to make general comments or say hi to each other or say wow or that's cool. Um, that's also totally fine. Um, and we will get to hopefully a, a Q&A section about five to 10 minutes at the end where we can answer some of your questions verbally. Um, this is a two hour session. Um, so we'll have about 20 minutes of uh, ecology. Uh, the bulk of it will be about how to participate in the survey. And then we'll end up with a little bit of how to identify bumblebees of the Southeast. Um, and with that, I will let Rich take it away in showing us to Xerxes. Gabriella, do you want to pop on and just say hi real quick to everybody? Yep, sure. Hi, I'm like Lori said, I'm Gabriella Garrison. I am a wildlife biologist with the North Carolina State Wildlife Agency, the Wildlife Resources Commission. And I'm so excited that this project is launching. We've been talking about it for a while, and I think it's going to be a huge success thanks to everyone's help and contribution. So thanks so much for joining tonight and uh, looking forward to the summer. Great, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Rich Hatfield. I'm a senior conservation biologist with the Xerces. I'm based in Portland, Oregon um, and direct Xerces bumblebee conservation programs, which currently um, largely means managing these large atlas projects. We're now in um, 15 states across the country, almost coast to coast um, and um, with plans to expand next year. So really excited to be launching this brand new project and excited to have Lori um, on the ground there um, in the Southeast to help you all along. And I also <laughs> apologize for any background noise. We are currently in the middle of a hail storm, which is pounding on the <laughs> skylight that I have in my room here. So apologies if that is, is uh, distracting background noise. Um, just a quick introduction here to the Xerce Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Um, we are a nonprofit. We're based in Portland, Oregon. We have staff all over the United States. Um, there's around 75 of us in a number of different programs. Lori and I both work for the Endangered Species Program, which focuses on sort of the conservation of invertebrates and advocating for their protection. We also have a native pollinators program that largely works on working lands with farms and, and areas like that. Um, helping um, those farmlands and, and farmers to attract native pollinators, as well as beneficial insects to their farms. Um, and then we also work on uh, aquatic invertebrates, largely freshwater mussels in, in the West. And then we have a butterfly conservation program, which is really the root of Xerces conservation work. We are actually named after the Xerces blue butterfly, which was the first butterfly to go extinct um, from human activity. It was native to the San Francisco Bay Area. And then we also have a pesticide program that sort of search, serves as the umbrella, tying all of these different programs together. Um, and this uh, program largely works on the education for folks, how to safely use pesticides um, while considering invertebrates in their habitat. 
and then also advocates for policies to protect them at the state, local, and federal level. Next slide, Lori. Um, we use education and outreach and advocacy um, to do our work. We have a whole host of resources available on our website, including a lot of free PDFs with plant lists and habitat installation guides. Um, we also have a whole host of popular books that are available at national and local booksellers, as well as at many libraries. Next slide. And we also um, just generally do a lot of on the ground science as well. We do a lot of rare invertebrate surveys across the country. Um, since we're based in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of our work um, happens here, which is why you'll see some of these photos with volcanoes in the background. Um, but yeah, we get this, this is what our office looks like sometimes. Um, but we also integrate with, with, with lots of members of the public to, to use community science as well to expand our reach and gather data across a, a, a more broad area. Next slide. Um, and that's what is on this slide here. So as I mentioned, we have Bumblebee Atlas projects in 15 states. We also run Bumblebee Watch, which is a North American project across all of the United States and Canada. Um, we do Western monarch um, counts a lot uh, for monarch butterflies that overwinter along the California coast. We map milkweed across the Western United States, do freshwater mussel surveys, and most recently launched our Firefly Atlas, which might, might be of interest for a lot of you down in the Southeastern United States. So if you're interested, um, please take a look for that. I'll try to drop a link to um, that project in the chat as soon as I'm done talking here. Next slide. And then we do a fair bit of, um, of advocacy as well. Where it's relevant, we'll either advocate for federal or state protection for invertebrates that need it, or um, advocating for policies, for instance, on, um, on pesticide approvals and things like that um, to protect invertebrates. Next slide. And as mentioned before, we do a lot of this through education and outreach. We work a lot through the NRCS, um, teaching professionals, um, as well as to, to agency biologists out there, working with them, helping them to understand how to monitor invertebrates and how to create and protect habitat for them. Um, we've, we've reached more than 100,000 individuals since 2008, um, and we've conducted trainings across all 50 U.S. states, all across Canada, Mexico, Europe, as well as in Asia. So we have a very, very broad reach. Next slide. And in addition to our sort of education, outreach, and science, we also do a lot of on-the-ground conservation. And much of this work is actually happening on farms. Um, and since, uh, since the early 2000s, we have helped install almost a million acres of habitat um, on farms and private lands across the United States. And we also have worked to help protect over 1.5 million acres for rare and, um, and at-risk invertebrates um, on public lands. Next slide. We are a member-based organization, and uh, if you are a Xerces Society member, I just want to thank you for being here today and for all of your support. If you are interested in our work and would like to help contribute, you can visit the URL there on the screen, xerces.org slash donate, um, and become a member if you'd like. It comes with a subscription to our uh, our quarterly um, newsletter called Wings. Um, and there are also um, gifts that come along with it, including um, some Xerces Society books. So please check that out if you're interested. And once again, if you are a Xerces Society member, thank you so much for your support and for being here today. And with that, I will turn it back over to Lori, who will be your guide through the rest of our two hours together. And just wanna say thanks again for all of you for being here today. I'm really excited to, to launch this project and get started. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rich. Um, I mentioned this a little bit before, but here's a general overview of how um, our time together is going to work out. We're going to start with a little bit of context for the project, some introduction and ecology uh, about bumblebees. Um, then a huge chunk of it will be how to participate in the atlas from A to Z. Then we're going to take uh, a quick five-minute break 
get a chance to get something to drink, stretch your legs, etc. And then we'll end up with some um, identification tips for bumblebees. Can I just talk about two housekeeping things here real quick, Lori? I'm sorry, I should have mentioned these at the top, but if you sure. feel like you need some sort of closed captioning, those are available via Zoom. If you go to your Zoom toolbar, probably on the lower right-hand portion of your screen, you may see a button that says captions or see three dots that says captions, um, or, or you click, that says more, and then you would click captions there and you can choose captions and a number of different languages. So please feel free to use those if that is helpful for you. Um, and also just wanna let you all know in case Lori didn't say this and she may have, but we are recording this um, and we will make a copy of it available on, on the website so that you can view the material later. So don't feel like you need to memorize everything that you're seeing and hearing here. We're gonna provide these resources for you um, on an ongoing basis. Thanks so much, Lori. Just, to, just wanted to make sure to get those details out front. No, thank you, Rich. Yeah, important to mention those. Uh, so why invertebrates? Um, and I feel like for this crowd, it's kind of preaching to the choir about why we would care about invertebrates. Um, and I've noticed in my career as an entomologist that um, I find I have to <laughs> um, defend bugs a lot uh, less. I think um, there's been a lot of legwork on the part of ecologists and entomologists to convince the public that um, bugs and other creepy crawlies are important. Um, but regardless, it still comes up every once in a while as to why sh we should care about invertebrates. Um, while invertebrates are a massive part of global biodiversity, they're about 90% of animal biodiversity. So 90% of animal species are invertebrates. Um, they are responsible for um, massively important processes um, in our ecosystems from decomposition to biocontrol in both our natural um, uh, areas and our farms. Um, there are thousands upon thousands of species of parasitoid wasps, um, like the one in the picture there, that are responsible for helping keep um, populations of other insects in check. Um, and then on the flip side, they are also the base of the food chain. So a lot of um, animals, you know, right from um, other insects to fish up to grizzly bears depend on insects as part of their diet. Um, and the collapse of insects would lead to um, rippling effects um, across the whole food chain. And then most relevant perhaps to our discussion today is that insects are responsible for a great deal of pollination. And pollination is essentially plant sex. Um, and without pollination, we would have far less diversity in our plant world. Um, and we wouldn't have the products associated with pollination, such as fruit, seeds, nuts, etc. And our wild plants wouldn't um, be able to sexually reproduce. Um, so that is a massively important um, process. Um, we like to think of pollinators as kind of a keystone species, that is to say, um, given their, the, their relative presence on the landscape, they have kind of an outsized role in um, ecosystem processes. So more than 85% of flowering plants uh, require an animal to get pollen from point A to point B. Um, and in, in most cases, this is usually an insect. Um, although there can be plenty of other kinds of pollinators. Um, bees and other insects are critical to crop production. Much of our um, agriculture is pollination dependent. Um, I will say that if um, a lot of our calories come from wind pollinated crops, you know, grains, rice, etc. But we would be missing out on a major aspect of our nutrition. We would be living completely without certain things like watermelons, chocolate, um, coffee um, without pollinators. So our diets would be a lot less rich um, without the presence of pollinators. Um, and we like to emphasize the importance of wild bees in our agricultural system. So um, wild bees are providing essentially a free service, providing the majority of pollination in agriculture, um, whether or not managed honeybees are present or not. So some major groups of insect pollinators um, include uh, butterflies and bees, which I think get a lot of the cred, but also tons of other ones, flies, moths, 
wasps and beetles. And this is all in addition to some of the other animal pollinators, including the mammals, monkeys, bats, um, birds, and recently a frog was discovered to be a major pollinator of a certain, of a certain system um, down in South America, which is pretty cool, but we're focused on insects today. Um, but of our insect pollinators, it's noteworthy that bees are kind of flower experts. Um, they are the only pollinators that consume both pollen and nectar throughout their life cycle as both larvae and adults. Um, a lot of insects are more focused on getting the carbohydrate rich, sugar rich um, nectar, um, but bees are uh, very focused on both pollen and nectar um, and they feed it to their young and in doing so they get a lot of pollen on their bodies and are able to transfer it uh, from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. Um, and for that reason, on sort of a pound for pound basis, bees are probably our most effective pollinator out there. They're um, tailor-made essentially for um, pollinating. Um, and when most people think of a bee, they think of a honeybee. I've noticed this, um, I was trying to find like cool bumblebee prints for my home. And when I looked at bumblebee on Etsy, a lot of the images that come up were actually honeybees. Um, but besides honeybees, bee uh, diversity is massive. There are uh, a huge abundance and diversity of bees out there, not just honeybees. Um, we have six families of bee that are native to North America. Um, bees are in an order, the same order, taxonomic order as ants and wasps. Um, bees you can kind of think of as essentially a wasp that became a vegetarian. Um, bees are also distinct from um, their ancestors because they have branched hairs. Um, the majority of our bee species or the global bee species are solitary, um, meaning they conduct their life cycles alone without working um, with other uh, members. Um, about 65% nest in the ground and about 35% nest in cavities above ground. Um, and when we think about um, the evolution of bees, you can really look back and see the influence of the evolution of angiosperms or flowering plants um, as part of the, a critical part of the evolution of bees. So around the same time that um, angiosperms um, evolved is when we started to get an explosion of bee diversity and you can see sort of the co-evolution of flowers and bees and how they've really um, co-evolved and um, worked off each other <laughs> and produced um, species diversity for both flowers and plants. Um, so uh, bees are really uh, co-evolved with flowers. And then amongst this sort of phylogeny, what you're looking at here is a, a taxonomic phylogeny of bees. Um, only uh, a subset of these would be considered social, meaning that they live in groups, um, which um, if you are used to thinking about honeybees might be a surprise that so many of our bees are actually solitary. And then an even smaller subset of these bees are what we would consider eusocial, which means that there is um, reproductive partitioning, there's special castes, there's reproductive members, um, of, of this social group and um, people, uh, different bees do different tasks, so to speak. And then an even smaller um, portion of these bees make honey. So it's about five species of uh, honeybee and then a number of stingless bees uh, in the neotropics. So honey making is actually something that's fairly unique. So some of the things that we classically associate with honeybees are not necessarily indicative of bees as a whole. Um, so here is a poll question. I think Rich is able to start the polls. Um, Yeah, so um, how many species of wild bees are found in the US? So go ahead and select what you think it is. Um, and we will return with an answer. Is the, is the poll live, Rich? Yep, it's live. Okay. We've got about, oh, it looks like everybody's answered. So I'll end the poll now and it should pop up for everybody to see. 
Okay, awesome. I wasn't able to see it progressing. Um, oh, okay, awesome. It looks like we've got a lot of people on the right page here um, with most of the answers in 3,000 to 4,000, and you are correct. We have uh, about 3,600 um, species of wild bee in the US. So several thousand bee species in addition to just honeybees. Worldwide, there are 20,000 species of bee. In North America, there are 5,200. In the United States and Canada, that's excluding Mexico, 3,600. And then there are about 265 species of bumblebee whose scientific name is Bombus. Um, there are 265 Bombus species worldwide. And so given the massive diversity of, bumble, of bees that we're dealing with, um, why focus on bumblebees in particular, um, other than the fact that they're cute and um, an important part of our diversity, something that's noteworthy is that they have several traits that make them especially effective pollinators. Um, one reason for this is their physiology. Bumblebees are interesting amongst bees in that um, they can generate heat by vibrating their wing muscles to fly in cooler temperatures. Um, and this means you might see bumblebees active earlier in the day and at um, higher latitudes or higher elevations compared to other bees. And this allows them to remain active in these cooler environments, cooler and wetter, um, and be effective pollinators um, in these cooler environments. Another thing is their variable tongue lengths. Bee, bumblebees can have really long tongues, which allows them to utilize a wide variety of flowers. So um, and in general, as a group, we consider bumblebees to be generalists. They uh, feed on and pollinate tons of different uh, flower species. Um, and this tongue length varies within the group from about six millimeters to 18 millimeters long. And we'll come to this later. That tongue length is an important part of how we distinguish the species of bumblebee. Another thing that makes bumblebees interesting and effective pollinators is that they're big. They're big and they're strong. Um, and bumblebees are capable of, of something called buzz pollination, um, which is where they vibrate at a certain frequency to effectively dislodge pollen. Um, this is a very subtle GIF or video, um, but you should be able to see that bumblebee vibrating and essentially shaking the, shaking the pollen out of those porocytal anthers. Um, also, their large size means they can just physically better trigger certain flowers and even pry apart certain flowers, um, which makes them essential for certain plant species. Um, another interesting thing about bees is that we know that they have very good memories and are capable of, of learning uh, and storing a lot of information about their environment and learning from each other. So I'm going to show you a short segment of a video demonstrating bee learning. Bees were taught to move a ball to the center of a platform. If successful, they got a sugary treat. They were taught by other bees, by fake bees held by scientists, or by invisible ghost bees, actually a magnet. But they didn't learn so well from the ghost bees. Real bees were better teachers. Awesome. So that video, I think, demonstrates the ability of bees to um, learn from other bees to be adaptive. Um, we have evidence of bumblebees engaging in play um, and other interesting behaviors that um, really indicate how adaptive they are um, in their environment and how they're having to remember and store tons of information about flowers, where flower resources are available. So it's, it's very interesting. Um, when we look at North American bumblebee diversity and where our species are sort of concentrated, we have about 46 species of bumblebee in North America. And this diversity is highest um, in the Western coastal and mountainous regions. So here we have sort of uh, a very broad indication of where these bumblebee species are most rich um, and redder areas have more species and greener areas have less species. Um, in the Southeastern US, in our region here, this is where we have about 15 species, at least 15 species of bumblebee. Um, and that diversity is highest in the Appalachians. Um, but we have a high diversity, we're sort of a hotspot for um, plant species. 
we are a region of plant and endemism. So understanding pollinators in this region is an essential part of this, understanding our whole ecosystem, um, given the diversity that we're working with around here. Um, so uh, of those um, roughly 50 bumblebee species that we have in the US, most are social colonies founded by a single queen. Um, and these colonies are annual. They only last a single season. Um, and that queen dies uh, at the end of the season uh, after having been alive for about a year. Um, colonies are much smaller than honeybee colonies, which can have you know, 10,000 workers, but uh, bumblebee colonies can still be pretty significant, containing 25 to um, over 1,000 workers. Um, bumblebee nests, from what we know about them, and there's still a lot we don't know, uh, can be found in abandoned rodent burrows, bunch grasses, unmowed areas, rock walls, bird boxes. They like things messy. You might find them in a compost pile. Um, uh, yes, so we're still learning a lot about where they prefer to nest, but um, here's some of the areas. Um, and when we think of the bumblebee life cycle, so this is um, a graphic that essentially shows from left to right, the advancement of a year. So at the left, we're starting in um, maybe late spring, progressing through the summer and ending in the fall. So we're gonna start in the spring. So in the spring, a queen um, emerges from hibernation where she spent the winter um, and she spent the winter underground in a shallow hole. And she sets about um, collecting pollen and other floral and pollen and nectar and searching for a nest location. And once she has a nest location, um, she will supply it with uh, a waxen pot, which she fills with pollen and nectar. And then directly on that um, waxen pot, she will lay her eggs. And those uh, eggs will develop, will hatch into larvae. And like, um, just like butterflies and a lot of other insects, Bumblebees progress through a larval, a pupil, and an adult stage. So those larvae will ultimately pupate, um, and then they will close into adults. Um, and those adults will be the workers of the next generation, or workers um, uh, after the queen. So the queen at this point stops focusing on collecting floral resources, and her daughters become the workers, both collecting pollen and nectar and tending to additional larvae. And she focuses on laying eggs. She focuses on laying eggs and tending to larvae. Um, and then, as the season progresses, she will produce uh, reproductive members of the colony, so uh, males and new queens. Males essentially leave the nest. They go out there. Do, they do their own thing. Um, queens, uh, new queens, will return and essentially come back and forth from the colony as they build up their fat reserves because they're hoping to live through the winter. And these queens, new queens will, while they're out doing their thing, um, mate at least one time with another male. And then finally, the queen will find, um, the new queen will find a place to overwinter, spend the winter, and then the next season she will start her new colony and um, all her sisters and the queen from the previous colony will die out. Um, I mentioned that almost all of the bumblebees um, have this sort of colony life cycle, but we do have some cheaters. We have uh, a number of cuckoo bumblebees and what cuckoo bumblebees do is that um, they hijack a queen's nest, they kill, they overthrow and kill the queen and then essentially use that queen's workers to um, raise that, the cuckoo bees young. Um, and they have strong stingers and thick exoskeletons that enable them to, to battle um, bumblebees. Um, and I think I like to defend cuckoo bumblebees because this can seem brutal to people, but um, cuckoo bumblebees are uh, an important part of our ecosystem. They're pollinators as well. They're essentially predators for, for our bumblebees um, and they're part of um, their interesting diversity. Um, so I told you some of what we know about bumblebees, but there is so much that we don't know about them. Um, some really key things like where are these species occurring? Where are they thriving? Where are they struggling? Um, what are their habitat requirements? 
Um, what are the queens and males doing when they're leaving the nest? Where are they mating? Um, what's happening inside the nest? Um, really key questions. So why are we doing a bumblebee atlas? Um, many bumblebee species are in decline. So in this chart, you can see sort of the number of bumblebee species that occur globally. That's um, the colors that fill in these countries. So our um, nearly 50 species of bumblebee in North America. If you look at the pie chat chart coming out from that, the red, orange, and yellow colors indicate those that are listed as threatened under the IUCN red list categories. And over a quarter of our bumblebee species are, are listed as threatened. Um, so many of them um, are facing a, a degree of risk. Um, and the threats are, are not necessarily very clear, but it's, um, it's clear at this point that multiple threats are likely to blame, working both individually and synergistically. So it includes um, habitat loss and fragmentation, climate change, um, poor nutrition as a result of loss of, of flower resources and habitat, um, pesticide exposure, uh, pathogens and diseases, and all these things can sort of interact to make bees more susceptible to another one of these factors. So we like to think of it as sort of a death by a thousand cuts. Um, and so we know that our bumblebees are at risk, but um, we're lacking a lot of the baseline data that we need to take action and actually make management decisions um, concerning these bumblebees. So we're st still learning what a healthy bumblebee population or community actually looks like and where are they occurring. Um, and if we, um, if we don't have a baseline amount of data, then we can't detect these declines or recoveries um, to actually protect these species. And we know that community science works um, as an effective way to collect high quality data from uh, a wide area that could not be covered by a single team. Um, so I looked into, you know, what if, what if I just did the whole Southeast and it would take, it would take years, um, but we can benefit from volunteers like you who are actually going out um, of providing their expertise in an area they might know very well um, and effectively uh, collecting um, these data from a wide area. So as an example, um, community science uh, observations have greatly expanded our understanding of where rusty patch bumblebee, Bombus affinis, which is federally listed as endangered, where it occurs, particularly at the extreme east and west of its range. So now we know more about where it actually occurs and we can focus conservation efforts in those areas. All right, so that was um, a little bit about the ecology. And now we are going to get into the nuts and bolts of the actual atlas and how to participate in it. Um, we've mentioned it a couple of times before, but the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas is the newest member um, in a growing uh, contingency of, of uh, bumblebee atlases across the US. So it started with um, the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas led by Rich, um, spread out to um, the Midwest, California, and now to the Southeast. And tons of different agencies um, have been involved. It's been a massively collaborative effort to make this come to life. For the Southeast specifically, we work closely with these agencies, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, and Georgia Department of Natural Resources. And we're supported with, with funding and, and, and collaborate with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And if we look at our current understanding of bumblebees in the Southeast, so this is from a data database of bumblebee observations um, from museum collections, um, verified iNaturalist sightings, et cetera. We can look at what we currently know about bumblebees in the Southeast. Um, something you may notice is that um, there are um, conglomerations of sightings around urban centers. So if you were to back analyze where bumblebees love to live, you might assume that they love Atlanta, Charlotte, Raleigh, Nashville, and Memphis the most. And while there are certainly some great habitats 
um, for bees and some bees that love urban areas, that's not necessarily reflective of what's actually happening, more reflective of um, the bias and in, in effort in those areas. Um, and you can also see these gray, these gray dots are observations from before 2003. And so there are areas that haven't been visited for 20 or so years um, that we don't have recent data on. So an important thing going forward is to get data from those gaps um, between these urban centers, particularly Western Tennessee, the coastal plain, et cetera. So a little bit of an overview about how to participate. Um, first off is getting trained, which um, you are well on your way to doing that by, by viewing this uh, training. So this counts as a training, or you could also participate in an upcoming in-person training. We have a number of those coming up this year. Either one of those counts um, as part of the training. Um, once you've done that, you create a Bumblebee Watch account, and Bumblebee Watch is the site where we um, store and submit our data. And then you adopt a grid cell, and I'll explain that in a little second. And then once you've adopted your grid cell and you have your account, um, you survey at least two times within your grid cell using our standardized protocols during the upcoming field season. And a complete survey will include both data collection and a habitat assessment. And then when you've collected your data, um, you upload it to our portal at Bumblebee Watch. And I will go through step-by-step step on how to complete these. We also have resources, plenty of resources online for how to uh, participate in this project. Available on the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas website is our participant handbook, which also details many of the things that you will see in this presentation today. So first off, set, off, set up your Bumblebee Watch account. Um, by going to bumblebeewatch.org. Again, this is our portal where we collect our data. So if you click on uh, sign up here in the top right, um, you'll set up your profile, um, making sure to remember your um, username. And this is the username that's gonna be associated with all your submissions going forward. And then when you have your account, you're able to go to our adoption page um, using the URL there to actually adopt your grid cell. And so what we've done is we've split our Southeastern states into 276 grid cells that are approximately 50 by 50 kilometers. Um, and we do this in order to actually spread out our effort throughout the Southeast so that we're not uh, concentrated in, on those urban centers like you saw from that distribution map. Um, I, we imagine that urban centers or grid cells that are on um, highly populated places are going to be popular, so we may actually limit the number of individuals or parties that can adopt a given grid cell in order to spread out our efforts effectively. Um, as you're making a decision about which grid cell to adopt on the same adoption page, you can actually explore throughout your grid map. Um, to see where are some good places that would be good to uh, focus on for your surveys. So um, you can see all our projects here, but if you can focus specifically on the Southeast. And then if you zoom into the map, you can actually see uh, where we have designated high priority grid cells. And these high priority grid cells indicate areas that either have a high proportion of rare species sightings, so a high likelihood of seeing a species of significant conservation concern, which is a key focus for us, or an area that has had particularly low effort. Um, and the nature of these high priority grid cells is likely to change in the coming years as we collect data from them. Um, it's sort of actively updated. But if you find that you really wanna step up um, and um, go the extra mile, so to speak, in helping our project, consider adopting a high priority grid cell. Um, and those are the ones in green versus the ones in blue. And you can zoom in even further and um, view the layer called uh, USA protected areas to actually see the public lands that overlap with your given grid cell. And if you click um, on a shape in this layer, it will pull up some information uh, about that land so you can read more about it. 
Um, and some possibilities of where you can survey include your land if you have uh, available area with plenty of floral resources. You can ask a friend or a family member if you can survey on their land. You can um, survey on public roadsides and right of ways. Um, many state or federal lands, public lands, will we will have permits available through the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas. So stay tuned for resources on how to um, get connected with permits. That is a work in progress. We're still working on getting permits for some of these agencies, but I'm really excited about the places that um, we've gotten permits at so far. Um, and you can also obtain permission for city, uh, county, city, or local parks, um, which you will have to do yourself by reaching out to um, the associated land manager and just reach out, say, hey, I'm doing this survey. Um, uh, let me know if it's okay, and, and do let me know if you have any issues with that. Alternatively, for exploring your grid, we also have a Google Map layer resources resource, so you can actually see the roads um, and more detailed information about what's in your grid cell. So there's a QR code here if you want to scan it and actually go online to um, view this grid cell map, zoom in, search for parks within it. Um, and that will be a useful resource for thinking about where you wanna survey. There's a lot of text here, but it's important text. Um, I just want to mention that I, I said a few different types of places that you could survey, including private and public property, but please respect private property and ensure that wherever you're surveying, you have permission from the landowner to conduct those activities. Um, unless you have explicit permission for private lands, stay on public lands or roadside right of ways. Um, many public lands, as I mentioned, will require you to have permits on your person. Um, and again, some of these permits will be available through Xerces. So if you're signed up for our mailing list, you'll get updates about how to actually connect with those permits. Um, again, obtain permission for other parks not included on Xerces permits. Um, and please note that your grids can include all types of land types, both public and private. Um, and volunteers may not trespass on private land. When you're at the site, look out carefully for markers of private land, such as um, signs and fences. Um, if you find that you've been asked to leave or you discover that you've accidentally entered private land, um, pack up and leave even if you haven't finished your survey. And for your own protection from trespass claims, um, it's a good idea to have your permission be written, um, whether that's for private land or other land type, um, just to have written permission indicating your right to be there. So with that, um, we'll discuss what a survey actually looks like. If you've chosen your grid cell, you've signed up for it, you've done a bit of scouting of where you're gonna actually survey, um, we have a few different survey types to actually fulfill the requirements. So the first one, and which is kind of our golden standard for survey types is what we call a point survey. And for a point survey, you are going to select a site that is about a hectare. Um, it's not an exact science. You can just eyeball it. Um, and a good rule of thumb is that a hectare is like the inside portion of an outdoor track. It's also like two football fields, including the end zones. Um, so you can eyeball it to, to get that area. And then within that area, you are going to survey for 45 person minutes. And what we mean by person minutes is that the that's the amount of effort by a single person. Um, if you have uh, three people, each of those people could survey for 15 minutes for a total of 45 person minutes. Um, and then it, to complete this point survey, you need one complete bumblebee survey and one habitat assessment. And this is what we consider sort of our most robust um, data collection method and if possible, what we prefer as our, as our survey type. Well, let's say that you pick a grid cell that has really um, minimal available public lands uh, for you to survey on. In that case, we have an alternate roadside survey method in which you uh, select an approximately 10 mile stretch of road um, and along that stretch of road, you do five mini surveys um, along the route. And each of these mini surveys should be um, at least half a mile apart. Um, so you drive along, stop at a clump of flowers and survey for this time 15 person minutes. 
and you do five of those at each of your stops or five, one at each of your five stops. Um, and so in this case, a roadside survey will include five mini bumblebee surveys and five habitat assessments. Um, and just for safety, please note that uh, on busy roads where bright colors are safety vests, avoid busy freeways um, and make sure that your vehicle is, is out of the way of traffic and you're visible um, to passerby. Um, in addition to the roadside and point surveys, each survey type is going to include a brief habitat assessment. So when you're done collecting your bumblebees, you are going to spend a little chunk of time actually taking some notes and observations about the kind of habitat. Um, and this helps us to understand um, the habitat preferences of these bumblebees and where they're actually thriving. So these include questions about what kind of habitat are you in? Um, what habitat surrounds your survey site? What plant species are you dealing with? Is the area being managed? Um, really quick questions, and we'll go over later about um, how to actually go through that. Um, there's a third type of survey, um, which we're calling incidental observations, uh, and these are more casual, say that you've caught the bug for identifying uh, bumblebees, and you find yourself out and about, and you would like to um, submit uh, a random bumblebee observation, this helps us, um, and you can do it anywhere and use our Bumblebee Watch app uh, to do so. However, this does not count towards your minimum requirement of two surveys within your grid cell. This is more supplemental, um, but it's still valuable uh, data for us. Okay, so now into the nuts and bolts of how the survey works. So we're gonna start with planning, then we're actually gonna go out into the field and collect the data. Um, then we're gonna photograph our bees and then upload our data to Bumblebee Watch. So when you're planning when to survey, um, our window for this upcoming field season is gonna be between May 15th and September 30th. I would encourage you to focus your surveys on sort of that June, July, August window, because as it gets later in the season, when the bumblebees sort of go to ground can vary quite a bit. Um, but otherwise, any, any time between May 15th and September 30th is valid. Um, optimal conditions are 60 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, I'll note that bumblebees and a lot of other pollinators don't necessarily like it boiling hot. So if it's, you know, 110 degrees at 1 p.m., um, I think you can stay inside and be fine and focus on those nicer days and maybe focus on the mornings. You don't need to, to um, be out there in the boiling sun. Um, uh, low winds, less than 20 miles per hour, and then also no rain. Um, bumblebees won't be active when it rains, so it's not a very useful time to go out. So pollinators are nice. I've enjoyed being a pollinator um, biologist because they like to be out when I like to be out. So that's helpful. When you're thinking of what kind of places you can survey, um, it's very, very flexible. You can focus on natural areas, urban areas like backyards, public roadsides and right-of-ways again. Um, and again, just follow those posted rules and regulations. An ideal uh, survey scenario would be um, native flowers. And we will note that um, a lot of sort of garden flowers that are bred to be attractive um, are not necessarily bred to be useful for pollinators, so things with multiple petals. Um, so just be sure that if you're in an urban area with lots of garden plants, that they are actually including flowers that are being visited by bumblebees. And then when you're in your site, where are some good locations? Um, uh, open areas are especially good for bumblebees, the chief thing being um, lots and lots of abundant and attractive flowers, so grasslands, open forests, um, riparian areas, um, flowering areas at the coast, wetlands, so long as there are flowers, um, regions of the mountains are important, especially for our rare species, and even developed areas uh, if there are a lot of gardens and uh, planted things around. Um, all of these are potential areas for good bumblebee activity. Um, there are a number of required materials that you want to make sure that you have before setting out. 
Um, first thing is an insect net. Um, and we make some recommendations on the resources page of the Southeast Bumblebee Atlas website for what kind of net to get and where to get it. Um, so the usual one that we recommend is one from Home Science Tools, um, just 17 bucks. It's sturdy uh, and effective for the price. Um, you'll also want 10 to 25 um, uh, collection vials or jars. Um, we tend to use 30 to 50 milliliter centrifuge tubes, which you can get in bulk via Amazon or via scientific supply stores like Carolina Biological Supply. Um, and I've included in the participant handbook a link to some potential vendors. Um, but you can also use empty jars or, um, yeah, empty jars <laughs> are effective as long as it's, it's sealable watertight. Um, and clean, it's, it's fine for a bumblebee survey. Um, you'll want a small cooler or an ice chest to store ice in. Um, you'll want some ice. We recommend crushed ice, but I used block ice on a recent survey and it was totally fine. Um, but crushed ice does tend to cool bees down a little quicker. Um, pencils, you want pencils for writing your data down, a permanent marker. Um, we'll get to why in a second. Um, you'll want a stopwatch or a timer, and one on your phone is effective. Um, you want to have your permits with you if that's applicable, transportation to and from your site if that's needed, and then making sure that you're looking after your own biological needs as a human. So make sure that you have water with you on these crazy humid hot days and that you have sun and heat protection. Um, some other suggested materials, not necessarily required, but might make your life easier, are a clipboard to actually press your data sheets against, a GPS device, if that's useful for you. I tend to use my phone um, in the field with, with no issues, so long as there's some amount of service. Um, although you may want to bring paper versions of maps if you think you're going to a place without um, sufficient cell phone service. Field guides are a nifty thing to have in the field. Um, although again, I tend to use iNaturalist and iPhone apps for identifying things in the field if I need to. And then I would recommend, especially if you're gonna be working in a game land or a place where there's hunting or perhaps even a roadside to invest in a safety vest. They're really cheap online. You can get them in bulk if you want. Um, and I've included a suggested vendor there. Um, so, you know, once you've gotten your materials in place, you think you know where you're going before you set out, just be mindful of your safety, check the weather conditions, things can change on the dime out there, especially summers in North Carolina when a sudden storm sets in. Consider a few locations with a grid cell as a contingency plan just in case something's blocked off or the flowers aren't out. Make sure that someone knows your plans, knows that you're going to be setting out, uh, potentially working in a remote area capturing bees. Um, respect all local rules and legislations. Do not trespass on private property. Um, be mindful of hunting seasons, especially on game lands. Um, if you are going to be in a place uh, where there's potentially hunting, uh, go at low activity times and wear blaze orange, hat, vest, etc. Um, for roadside surveys, again, remain visible and park out of the way of other vehicles. So there's your planning. So, okay, so you've done it, you've planned it, you've made it to your site with all your materials. Now, what do you do? So we have a data sheet um, and I would suggest starting out by filling out some of the things in your data sheet. You don't necessarily need to do this first, but I think it's best to do this before you forget. So this information includes a brief site name, um, the idea of your grid cell, the date, the latitude and longitude, which we would like in decimal degrees rather than degree minutes. Um, you want your number of observers and the names of those observers. A little information about what kind of survey you're doing. So we discussed that um, we have both point uh, and roadside surveys. And then on the right there, you see a cell called survey method. Um, and essentially what this is referring to is that if you find you've gotten really good at BID and you're really practiced, you can choose to only collect one of each of the more common species and then just focus on the things that are new. 
Um, but I would suggest if you're just starting out to just collect everything you see and circle all there. You captured all the bees that you saw. Um, you're gonna estimate the survey, survey area. It doesn't need to be exact. And then a little information about the weather, the temperature, you're gonna estimate the cloud cover, what percentage of the sky above you is covered by clouds and the wind speed. Um, and I tend to just use a weather app for this or um, look at the nearest weather station um, uh, to actually get this information. And so you filled in the top of your data sheet and it's time to start surveying. So this is where the timer comes in. You want to keep track to make sure that you are getting your 45 person minutes. So when you actually start surveying, you have your net on you, you have some vials on you, start your timer and start searching throughout your hectare. Um, observe flowers, um, uh, observe for anything uh, feeding on a flower um, and capture all bumblebees that you see. Um, once you've captured a bumblebee, you're going to place that bumblebee in its own vial. You're going to number that vial with a permanent marker. And if you caught the bumblebee off of a flower, photograph that vial with your flower, with the flower it was on, so that we can keep track of what the species of flower these bumblebees are actually visiting. Then you're going to place your vial to chill on the ice and continue searching. Um, something that I um, have trouble with as a pollination ecologist is it's the a big headache for me that timer is important making sure that we get accurate um, notion of our effort and I always forget that um, so you're supposed to pause your timer when you are actually handling your bee and you're not actively searching so once you've caught your bee stop your timer um, keep your timer stopped while you're putting your bee in your vial and putting it in the ice. And then remember, this is the thing I always forget, to resume your timer once you start walking around again. Um, a lot of folks have questions concerning the actual handling of the net and how to actually get the bee inside the vial. And that makes sense if you're just starting out handling bees, it can be intimidating. Um, and so we have some tips here, and I would encourage you, if you have a chance, we will have some field days coming up where you'll get a chance to actually get some hands-on um, efforts uh, and experience doing this, and we can walk through it together how to actually do this. Um, but the way it works is uh, when you're actually handling your net, you can capture a bee a few different ways. You can either swing directly at the bee while it's on a flower. Bees on flowers are actually pretty preoccupied with being on the flower and are not necessarily noticing um, that a big net is swinging at them. So they can be quite bumbling, so to speak. Or if you're a bit shy about that, you can actually bring the net down directly on top of shorter vegetation. And then when your net is on top of them, bees actually tend to fly up. Um, which is useful because then you can isolate the bee into a smaller part of the net um, and use that small part of the net to transfer it to a vial. So when you're transferring it to the vial, you take the lid off, you slide that vial into your net while you have the bee isolated into a small area, put the vial on top of the bee, making sure to mind her feet and close the top carefully. Um, you might uh, have questions about stings. Um, Stings are uh, very, very rare, though they can happen. Um, I have been stung once by a bumblebee, and it's because I accidentally grabbed her. Um, bumblebee females will sometimes sting at the nest or if they're being handled. Um, when they're cold, bees can be safely handled because they're not terribly active. Um, be mindful of your own safety if you are allergic please carry an EpiPen with you, practice extreme caution. Um, stings can, can happen, but again, they are very rare. Um, bumblebees don't sting readily um, if they have a chance. And again, if you wanna get some uh, on the ground experience with this, you can attend one of our upcoming events. Um, we have the in-person workshops where there's some hands-on hands opportunities to do this. And then stay tuned for our shorter field days, which are sort of two to three our opportunities where we can just hang out in a field collecting bumblebees together. And there will be 10 of our field days uh, this coming season, about two per state. So keep out, keep a lookout for that. Um, I have a short video here just demonstrating how to actually net a bumblebee. Um, and this is 
Ross Winton from formerly of Idaho Fish and Game. When you're out collecting your bumblebees, you want to make sure you're doing it carefully, but you also want to make sure you're doing it with a technique where you're actually going to be successful in capturing the bumblebee. Now, the best way to do it is to come from the side. You'll actually sweep over the tops of the flowers, but the most important part is to make sure you follow through and have the net droop over the side of the rim, and you can actually flip it over a third time so the bee can escape. And another way, you can come from below the bee if the flower is kind of drooping, and you can come up. But again, you have to have that follow through where you flip the net over the top. Another way, if you're feeling a little more timid about sweeping really hard, is bees tend to fly up when they try to escape. So you can actually put the net over the top of the flowers that it's on, and the bee will usually fly up to the top of the net or once it gets about halfway, you can just tip the net over and then it'll be captured in the bottom of your net. All righty. Um, just a little bit of a word about cooling your bee. Um, bumblebees are absolutely, and most insects are, are absolutely fine being cooled down. It slows their movements. So it allows you to handle them safely. Um, but make sure that your ice is not below freezing. Some freezers cool to zero degrees Fahrenheit. We tend to um, recommend avoiding chiller packs because those can sometimes run below uh, freezing um, and actually potentially be lethal to the bees. So just be mindful of not cooling down your bees too much, just to freezing. Store-bought ice is usually just right. Um, and so when you are finished capturing your bees, when you've done your 45 survey, survey minutes, you're going to indicate at the top of your data sheet how long you spent doing that survey, when you started and ended. And so note that since we are asking that you stop your timer when you're actually handling the bees, 45 person minutes of surveying can be um, something like an hour, an hour and a half of actual time spent in the field. So just be mindful of that. You may also find if you don't have enough uh, vials that you uh, fill all your vials before the end of your 45 minutes, in which case you can process your bees, let them go, and then start up again just any way that you can fill that 45 minutes. You don't have to do it in a particular order. So once you have all your bees in hand and in your cooler on ice, uh, the most essential part of this project is taking effective photographs and recording your bees. Um, you can use any way which makes the most sense to you to track which of your photos um, correspond to which individual. Um, on my iPhone, when I take a photo and click information, they're um, numbered with unique ID number. So that's how I've been doing it. On uh, a camera, there's typically a unique ID number associated with each photo. So we have a cell here, which however way you're gonna do it, write down uh, the unique ID for that bee so you can track which photos correspond to which species. Um, my, our colleague Leaf uh, writes down the time that he caught the bee and that helps him match up the photos to the correct bee, um, however way works best for you. You're going to indicate your best guess. You don't need to be right. You don't need to be confident about which bumblebee species that you have. If you don't know, just put unknown. Um, you can take a best guess as to whether you're working with a queen, a worker, a male, a female, um, and the associated host plant, just to the best of your abilities. Scientific names are ultimately preferred, but if you just wanna put a description, like this was a red tubular flower, anything to help you ID it later or for us to ID it later. And then this on the left here is just when you get to the point where you're going to upload these online um, to help you check off as you actually get them in there. Uh, you, it's, it's fun and useful to be a good uh, bumblebee idea and to practice your bumblebee ID, but the chief part of this uh, of this project is that verified experts are actually going to be double checking your IDs. So the most important thing is to get clear photographs. Um, so photos should include key parts of the bee that we need to uh, ID them to species in post. 
So for southeastern bumblebees and for a lot of bumblebees, this will include the head. So this will include um, a photo that includes the front of the face and the hair on the front of the face is important for IDing a lot of bees. The hair on the top of the head or the vertex, the color of that hair is gonna be critical for distinguishing some species. And then the length of the face or the cheek um, is also going to be really key for um, distinguishing species. So at least one of your photos should capture the head and include, and it can be like a three quarters angle, including the top of the head, the front of the head, and the length of the face. Then we want a photo including some of the details from the thorax. So some of the key details from the thorax, which is the area of the bee's body where the legs and wings attach, is we want to see the color of the hair um, in front of, between, and behind the wings. Um, and in particular, we want the colors of the hair below the wings on the side of the bee. Some useful other things to see are, is there a circle or a stripe between the wings? Um, is there a, a black notch on that circle? Um, so again, a side or three quarters view that includes a view of the top and the side of the thorax is really essential. And you can see in that photo there that you also get the side of the abdomen to some degree, which is also super useful. But you should also be sure that your abdomen, your shot of the abdomen includes the top and the side of the abdomen. What are the colors of the segments referred to here as T1, T2, T3, etc.? cetera? Um, what color are they on the top and the side? Um, distinguishing what colors are there are gonna be really essential. So head, thorax, abdomen. Uh, again, just to, to hammer this home, the quality of the photos is essential. If you've gone out and made all the effort to survey and your photos aren't clear enough to, um, uh, to verify in post, then um, uh, you may have wasted your time a little bit, except have had a wonderful day perhaps. Um, so just some examples, the, the photo on the top left is beautiful and is a great shot of the thorax, but doesn't really show the abdomen. A lot of these photos are fuzzy or dark or silhouetted. Just before you go home, check, before you release your bees and before you go home, check that your photos are clear and well lit. Here's an example of a good one. This bee is well lit. We can see the top of the thorax. We can see most of the abdomen. And it's totally fine to have your fingers in the photos. You can gently part the wings if you'd like to get a better view of that abdomen. Um, we're not looking for National Geographic quality photos. We're just looking for ones that are verifiable. So it's okay to have your fingers or a pen um, in that image gently moving or holding the bee. And again, they're cool. So they're not, they're not gonna be active. So summary of the actual time spent in the field is that you're gonna capture your bee um, using an insect net, transfer that bee into a clean vial, put that vial into a cooler with ice. Um, after about 10 to 20 minutes, that bee will be cool enough to, um, to handle. So after 45 minutes of surveying, she'll be totally ready for you to um, remove and photograph. Um, she can stay in that cooler for up to two hours safely. Take detailed photos, that's essential, and then release your bee within 100 meters of the capture location. Essentially release her in the same spot so she can warm up and get back to business. It'll take them a few minutes to warm up. I like to place mine in the sun, give them a chance to stretch their wings, and then they'll just take off like nothing happened. So once you have photographed uh, and uh, let your bees go, um, we would like you to conduct a habitat assessment. Again, really key information that lets us know the preferred habitat types of the bees that you collected and what kind of environment they're living in. So indicate the predominant habitat type of your site. And we've sort of narrowed it down to some really broad categories here. So circle which one you feel best fits your site. Um, and then in that surrounding area, um, in this cell here, you can click or you can fill in the surrounding habitat types that indicates uh, which ones are most relevant surrounding your area. So the context of your site is also essential for understanding what kind of environment you're working in. And then you're gonna indicate what percentage of your survey area has flowering resources um, and to indicate what that might look like. Here's an environment on the left where we can't see any, any flowers. 
um, probably not worth serving in one like this until something starts flowering, but this is an example of a 0%. And then this is would be an example of a 90 to 100%. Um, it's tempting to think literally and to think like bird's eye view of this area is covered with yellow flowers, uh, but it's more just an estimate of what percentage of that area has flowering resources available, has something growing there that's producing a bloom. So you just eyeball it, make an estimate, um, and do your best to indicate what, what percentage of your area has something growing on it that's blooming. Then we have some um, fields to indicate what kind of nesting habitats are potentially available. So that includes um, bunch grasses, evidence of rodent holes, um, piles of brush, bare soil. If there's a leaf litter, a duff layer, rock piles, mulch, um, and some um, areas for you to indicate what kind of management types are potentially at this area. So you can indicate yes, no, or potentially maybe um, for whether there's evidence of mowing at that site, livestock grazing, agriculture, uh, pesticide use, whether it gets burned, um, whether there are honeybee hives nearby. You can also indicate some notes about the site. For example, if you noticed uh, a lot of honeybees, maybe you didn't see a hive, but maybe you noticed there were a lot of honeybees on site, or maybe it's a high traffic area. Um, those might be things that are worth noting. And again, you try this, try to fill this out to the best of your ability. If you feel up to it, you can also um, contact the landowner to get um, information about some of this, um, or just use the clues you have available to fill this out. Just an example of those bunch grasses. Um, and on the right, there's a, a big brush pile, which I mean, I would, I would hang out with in if I was a bee. And then flowering plants. Um, we would love information concerning what flowering plants were growing at your site. And you don't need to be a botanist to fill this out, um, but you will probably learn a lot about plants in the course of participating in the study. So indicate how many species of flower, to the best of your ability, are in bloom within your survey area, um, how many different species, and then you're going to list which plant species are in bloom. And that sounds like a tall task if you don't necessarily um, know all your plants. I don't know all my plants, but we're just going to try to the best of our ability. So if you know the name uh, specifically, you can write it down. Um, if you just have a description, um, say you know it's a thistle and it's tall, you can write that down and take an image for you to ID later. Or if you don't know, just write that down and take a picture of the plant for you to ID later. Um, while you're in the field, uh, just do your best and uh, you can return to actually ID what you have um, in post. We're also interested in getting some information about the, the time and effort that you spent on this, on this project so that we can get a sense of how much, how much of your time you've dedicated to this. Um, so if you could indicate when you stopped and started surveying overall, including the time it took to travel there and then the time you took to enter that data, that helps us know um, and appreciate how much effort is being put into this project. Just some bee safety, and by bee safety, I mean safety for the bees, um, things to note is that it's a good idea if you are going to be conducting your surveys at different sites for your two times um, to sterilize or clean your containers between those sites and also your net. And there's a few different ways to do this. You could use a 10% bleach solution, um, let them soak for about 30 minutes, rinse it really well, and then air dry it. You could spray it with alcohol. Or if you don't have any of those materials uh, available, you could just manually scrub it with hot soapy water rinse it really well so there's no soap residue and let it air dry. And so this prevents the spread of pathogens uh, between your sites. Um, it may also be a good idea to wipe and sanitize the bottoms of your shoes. Um, that might be overkill, but it's something I tend to do just to minimize the risk of transferring seeds, invasive species, pathogens between sites. Um, be sure that you limit bees time in the vials at ambient temperature. This is particularly important in the hot and sweaty southeast. You may find while the bee is in the vial and not in the cooler that it will start to look humid in there and she may look a bit stressed out. So limit the amount of time that she is in the tube and then not 
in the cooler. Um, what I tend to do is um, I have a fanny pack on me and I keep vials in that fanny pack. And then I have some of the ice actually in the fanny pack so that it's cool in there to some degree. Um, and she's less stressed while I'm carrying her around for those five minutes, but it's up to you as long as you quickly get her in that cooler. Um, once they're in the cooler, they're safe, but it's best to also limit their time in there while their metabolism is low, um, up to about two hours, and then release them. Um, and again, release them near their capture locations, let her return uh, to, her, to her busy work of collecting uh, floral resources. Um, so just some bee safety. All right, so you've gone out and done it, collected the data, collected your photographs, um, wipe the sweat off your brow and gone home, maybe taken a shower. Um, now it's time to upload your data. Um, so we, again, enter our data at bumblebeewatch.org. Um, it's a good idea, just in general data housekeeping practice to enter it as close as possible to when you collected it. You may find as you're going through your data sheet that, oh, I don't quite remember, you know, what happened on this particular day or you're not sure about what you wrote. Um, so just uh, entering it as close as to when you collected it helps prevent some of those mishaps. Um, double checking that you're keeping a good record of which photos go with each bee, either by the number photo or the timestamp. Um, it might be useful ahead of time to pick out which photos are most useful for which bee. And for each bee, we want several photos that head thorax and abdomen and the photo of the host plant that you took while you're out in the field, if possible. So go to Bumblebee Watch. This is a landing page. Uh, you're going to click on record a sighting from that header there, and you're going to click on Bumblebee sighting. And this is, again, assuming that you have made your Bumblebee Watch account. There it is. Um, and you're going to start by indicating which project that you're collecting for. Um, so indicate Bumblebee Atlas. There are a number of other associated projects, so this just helps us associate your um, observations with Bumblebee Watch. And then essentially you're going to go down through the digital data. It's a digital version of your data sheet and just enter the data as it appears in your data sheet. So you're going to enter a location. You can give your location a, a unique name, a name that makes sense to you. And then when you return to it, um, this info will actually autofill um, uh, when you have a site name. Enter your latitude and longitude. Um, in this area, our <clears throat> longitudes start with a negative, so just be mindful of that. Your province or state, um, the accuracy of this location, this indicates your degree of confidence that this location indicates where you actually uh, were, and then the date of your sighting. And then there are going to be various drop-down menus for Survey type, roadside or point, collection method, that's that whether you collected all bees or whether you're a bumblebee expert and only collected every unique species. Um, approximate hectares, surveyors, when you started, when you ended, and the weather information. So just getting that all in there. You're gonna enter all your habitat info. Again, there's gonna be a drop-down menu with those main habitat types that we indicated. Um, woodland, uh, marsh, uh, wetland, etc. Um, you can indicate um, the surrounding area that you indicated if that's relevant, the percentage of the survey area that had flowering resources available, and check off which of these potential habitat types that you witnessed. Um, management info, again, drop down menus, whether you saw yes, no, or suspected evidence of any of these management types. And then flower species. So you can indicate sort of a range of how many flower species um, that you saw at your site. And then here are some info to actually enter the plant species that you saw. And at this point, um, you will likely have done some legwork to actually figure out what plant species you're working with. Um, down to genus is fine, just as specific as you can get with it. Um, enter all the plant species that you saw. Uh, then you indicate more about your effort, just keeping track of all the hard work that you're doing. And once you have filled out all that initial information, you're going to move on to step two of the online form, which is when you're going to actually um, upload your photos for each individual. 
So the way you do this is that you drag and drop the photos that you have prepped for this um, individual. Pick the best five photos, and one of those should be the flower, if that's available. Um, indicate what species you think it is. If you're not sure, that you can just indicate generally that it's a bumblebee. Um, take any notes that you feel are relevant, um, including what you think the flower it was on was. And if you would like to um, get some help or, or uh, get some practice identifying, we do have an identification tool to help you narrow down what kind of bumblebee species you might have seen. So as you're entering for a given individual, if you click identification tool, you will be, uh, it'll open a box with some drop down menus where you can actually click on some of the features that you see and it will narrow down and suggest what it might be. Um, this is optional. You don't have to do this. You can just say bumblebee. This is if you wanna get practice again, um, mostly us will be verifying these photos on the back end. Um, but I think it's a fun exercise to actually learn about what uh, species that you're capturing in the field. Once you've entered one individual, you can click add another here and it'll open up the same uh, options again for your second individual. So again, photos, species, floral host, additional notes, and you keep clicking add another until you have entered all your bee species. And when you're done, you click save. So that's uploading the data. Um, I, I talked about um, the importance of identifying your plants. Again, you do not need to be an expert botanist. You can just try it to the best of your abilities. If you would like some resources about how to get better with wildflowers, um, here are some books. I can speak personally to wildflowers of the Atlantic Southeast and wildflowers of the Sandhills region, um, since I both ho have those ones personally um, and I'm North Carolina biased. Um, but I've also um, seen good things about uh, wildflowers of Georgia and that uh, the Tennessee and Ohio Valley one. And I tend to use iNaturalist um, or the Seek app, which is associated with iNaturalist, um, which has tools for um, automatically suggesting what um, species that you're looking at. So a massively useful tool. And then you can um, upload that data to iNaturalist and have it be ready there. <laughs> um, I went through a lot of information, uh, but we are going to take a quick five minute bio break. Um, and when we return, we're gonna talk about some Bumblebee ID and then take some questions. So let's come back here at, uh, let's say 7.30. All right, see you soon. <laughs>
right, welcome back. Um, let's get going again. So we have raced through the introduction to um, bumblebee biology and their conservation, um, the basics of how to participate in the atlas. Um, and now we are going to go through a little bit about bumblebee identification, just some real basics. Um, if you want a more in-depth exploration, um, we will be covering that at some of our in-person workshops. Um, if you'd really like to dive deep onto that, today will be more of an overview of bumblebee identification. Um, so we're going to start out really, really broad and actually determine how to um, differentiate bee from uh, non-bees or flies and from bees versus wasps, and then bumblebees versus other bees, and then narrow it down from male versus female, and then cuckoo versus non-cuckoo. And then we're going to cover some of the most common ones, as well as at least one of greatest conservation need that it will be a good idea to know how to ID. So you've seen this image a few times before, but just some brief anatomy. Um, the three main parts of an insect are the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Um, and for the face, we have the front, we're calling it the face, the front, the top of the head, which is the vertex. And these areas are super key for identification. As I've discussed before, the color of these hairs is gonna be really key. We have the compound eyes and we have the ocelli or the ocelli. Um, singular ocellus. Um, these are sort of um, rudimentary light collecting organs versus the compound eyes, which is what we would more traditionally associate as being eyes. Um, we, the thorax is the part of the insect body that the limbs and the wings connect to. So um, bees have two pairs of wings and three pairs of legs. And then on the hind leg, which will be noticeable on female bees, is the corbicula or the pollen basket, which in bumblebees is a, um, on non-cuckoo bumblebees is a hairless area, um, literally forming a physical basket surrounded by hairs It holds pollen. And then I'm going to be referring to these a number of times as the tergites. It's the segments on top that you can see from looking down upon the bee of the abdomen. Um, females have six segments and we tend to um, abbreviate it as T1 through T6 while we're referring to the colors of those segments. Um, we have sort of a flow chart here of say you start with an insect um, or maybe you start with a bird. Maybe we're starting <laughs> really, really early on in the process and you wanna narrow it down to whether, uh, what bumble spe species or what kind of bumblebee you're dealing with. So we're gonna start with bee versus not a bee. All right, so um, it behooves a lot of insects to look like a bee because bees are stinging um, and they have this distinctive um, yellow and black warning coloration a lot of the time that lets predators know I am not good to eat. And a lot of other insects take advantage of this uh, by mimicking. Um, only one of the insects on this page is a bumblebee. Um, everyone else is a fly, so it can get really tricky. So it's, there are some tips for distinguishing the two. Um, a key thing is that bumblebees have two pairs of wings for four wings total, while flies have two pairs of wings. Um, flies are in the order Diptera, which means literally two wings. That's how many wings they have. Um, the second pair of is they, they kind of have two pairs of wings, but the second pair is reduced to these structures called halters, which are behind the first pair of wings. So only one pair of wings is really visually apparent. Um, bumblebees will carry large pollen loads and oftentimes will actually have these um, uh, large baskets full of uh, really apparent pollen, which will show up. Um, or it may be all over their bodies, whereas flies tend not to carry as much pollen. Uh, bumblebees are uh, generally very hairy. They're big and fluffy, um, while in comparison, flies tend to be not as hairy or have areas of, of bare 
um, surface. Um, this isn't always the case. There are some really cute and fluffy flies out there. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, bumblebees are hairier. And remember, like all bees, they have branched hairs. So if you have a chance to get really close, um, you can see the branched hairs on the bumblebee. Bumblebees have longer antennae. They, um, the antennae are made up of a scape and then several flagella um, resulting in a long antenna, while as uh, flies have an interesting shaped um, stubby antenna, um, which is not as apparent as the bee antenna. And then the eyes are a big clue. So a lot of flies will have large um, bulging eyes near the front of the head, sometimes essentially making up the entire head. Um, while bees will have eyes on the side of their head. Um, here's a little quiz. Is this a bee or a fly? Just type it in the chat what you think it is. And they'll just give you a second. <laughs> Right? Yep, y'all know, y'all know what's up that I was trying to trick you. This is a fly, specifically a robber fly. Um, this is a guy I saw in the field. He's got one pair of wings. Note the halters there indicating um, not a true set of wings, just the one pair. Stubby antenna, bulbous eyes. He's a robber fly. He's got a distinct um, divot between those eyes. And I actually clocked him as not a bumblebee because of his behavior first. He wasn't hovering around flowers. He was sitting on a leaf and um, racing out to attack things. So behavioral um, cues are also really important for distinguishing them. But you can see how it can be tricky. Um, and then you have bumblebees versus wasps. Um, uh, the, some of the key distinctions um, are that bumblebee uh, wasps have a wasp waist. Um, Bees, bumblebees have a waist too, but uh, wasps will very often have a really narrow slender waist. Um, they also have four wings, but they're often folded upwards. Um, again, like the flies, they will tend to carry little or no pollen compared to bumblebees. They tend to not be as hairy, often um, uh, visually devoid of hairs. And that yellow and black pattern that is so associated with bumblebees will be um, on the actual surface on the exoskeleton of the wasp rather than expressed through um, the hairs. So the yellow and black on a bumblebee comes from the fuzz. On a lot of wasps, it comes from the exoskeleton. There are some bees that have colorful patterned exoskeletons, but between bumblebees and wasps, it's a notable thing to, to look out for. Okay, so those are sort of the main key mix-ups of not a bees. Um, and there are plenty of resources if you find you don't have a bee for identifying those. We'll get to those in a little bit. But say you figure out, yes, I have a bee. <laughs> and you want to know if it's a bumblebee. Um, a common mix up one would be a bumblebee versus a honeybee. Um, honeybees have a sort of elegant uh, torpedo shaped abdomen versus the um, chunky and lovably chubby bumblebee. Um, I think honey bees are very polite in that they're actually honey colored, which helps with knowing what they look like. So they're sort of a more amber, um, orange brown color. Um, they will like bumblebees have um, a poly basket, so that's not necessarily a distinguishing feature. But one thing to note is that bumblebees have hairy eyes. So the hair is actually growing on their eyes. If you get a chance to look close enough for that, that's a good sign. I tend to use the fact that they're sort of a, that golden, almost honey-like orange brown to distinguish them. And once you get the gestalt of the difference, it's pretty easy to distinguish them in the field. Um, I have been going through the backlog of um, bumblebee watch identif uh, IDs that have been put online for the Southeast. And the most common non-bee mistake, non-bumblebee mistake that I've seen is I get a lot of carpenter bees uploaded there. They look very similar, so it makes sense. Um, to distinguish a bumblebee versus a carpenter bee, and they are the same family but different genre. Um, bumblebees have hairy abdomens. A key giveaway for the carpenter bee is that the abdomen is smooth and shiny beyond that first segment. It'll be very bare. Um, another distinguishing thing is bumblebees, uh, or the females will have that pollen basket, that distinct hairless section, 
while in the carpenter bee they'll have um, another kind of pollen collecting organ, the scopa, which will be densely hairy. Um, the way I find that I can find a, a carpenter bee versus a bumblebee is if you see a big bumblebee, a big heavy bee with a shiny abdomen hanging out uh, outside your wooden home, seeming to monitor um, your planks of wood, that's probably a carpenter bee monitoring, either a male monitoring for females or a female looking for a nesting spot. So behaviorally, they're a little bit different, but visually, um, there are a few key differences. All right, so that's bumblebee versus other bee. So say you know you have a bumblebee, so uh, what is a male versus a female? And this is important in the sense that sometimes males and females can have um, very different uh, color patterns or morphology. Um, sometimes they can have similar ones, but sometimes they're very different. And so for IDing to species, it's really important to know whether you're dealing with a male or a female. Um, so some of the key differentiations, just very generally, females tend to look well-groomed, almost combed, sometimes even buzz-cutted compared to the males, which tend to be a little shaggier, a little more unkempt. Um, females will have that pollen basket, that hairless um, apparent sort of concave zone on their hind legs, at least for the non-cuckoos, while males will have hair in that section. They won't have that hairless part. Uh, females have six abdominal, abdominal segments, while males have seven. Um, it'll be hard to count those on the fly, but um, once you get a visual sense for which are males versus which are females, you'll notice that males tend to have longer ganglier and abdomens with seven abdominal segments. Same deal for the um, antennae. Uh, males have longer antennae with 13 antennal segments, include, including the scape. Um, so they will have visually longer antennae once you get used to how long a female antenna is. Um, in some cases, males will have larger bulging eyes. They're almost fly-like in some of the species. You can look at that male on the right and notice how big his eyes are and good for, good for finding females, where, whereas a female has quote unquote normal eyes. And something that might be super key for knowing as you're going out and handling these bees is that male bees, and males of, of any um, uh, ant or wasp or bee species do not have a stinger. The stinger on female bees comes from the ovipositor, which is the egg laying organ. Um, so only females have a stinger and males, if you are super confident, can be handled when they're not cold um, with no risk of being stinged, of being stung. Um, one of the trickier things once you figured out if you have a male or a female is to distinguish whether you have a cuckoo or a non-cuckoo uh, bumblebee. Um, and it's a little tricky um, and um, it'll take a little practice to figure out, but the key thing is to look at the corbicula or that pollen basket on the hind leg. Again, the non-cuckoo female will have a bare um, concave sort of vented area on the hind leg there. Um, whereas in the female cuckoo, um, it may still be shiny, it may still have a little less hair, but it will be concave. Um, I've been thinking of it as sort of like if you sat on a toilet paper tube in a non-cuckoo versus a whole toilet paper tube for a cuckoo, it's more concave. Um, it can get pretty subtle, but in a male, oop, I see Rich circled that there, which I can do. Um, or put my cursor over it in a male uh, non-cuckoo uh, bumblebee, that hind section again will be hairy, but it will be um, dented and concave. Um, it can be subtle, but if you compare that to the male cuckoo, again, convex, completely hairy, um, not shiny. Maybe a little shiny, but not terribly compared to the female non-cuckoo. So it's subtle, it's difficult, um, but once you start getting more confident about it, it'll be interesting to actually see that feature in the field. Another important thing for distinguishing bumblebees to species is the length of the cheek. And what we're referring to the cheek is the bottom uh, of the eye to that um, flexing section of the mandible where the mandible attaches to the face. Um, bumblebees are super variable in their tongue length, um, and 
uh, colors are not always accurate for distinguishing to species. Sometimes you actually have to look at the length of the face. So Bombus affinis, rusty patch bumblebee, our federally listed bee, has a short, round, kind of heart-shaped face. And then compare it to uh, the black and gold bumblebee, Bombus oricomus, has a very long, narrow face. Um, so that is an important uh, feature to keep in mind. Um, Note that different castes, so male worker queen, can vary in color patterns. Um, sometimes queens workers males have different color patterns, so that's why it's important to know whether you're working with a male or a female. Um, they can have different sizes, although this isn't always reliable. Sometimes the different castes overlap in size. Generally, the queen is a lot bigger than her workers, um, and they have different periods of activity. If you think back to that um, seasonal um, sort of chart that we talked about earlier, the queens will come out first, be active earlier in the year. Then the workers um, will start doing the bulk of the collecting, and then you'll start seeing males um, preparing for mating, out doing their own thing. Um, so time of year um, is important. For this survey, we're really focused as much as possible. We've chosen that time window so that we're um, focusing mainly on workers, but it's still possible for you to get a male or a queen as part of your surveying. Also know that even within a cast, there is color variation. So just be mindful that um, color patterns are not a hard and fast rule. Um, just do your best to um, eliminate other possibilities and, and use them as sort of a, a signpost for what it might be. I've made this sort of uh, quick, quick guide to female bumblebees of the Southeast, um, uh, which includes species that you may see. So these are sort of the most common color patterns um, for all of these species and includes like for the lemon cuckoo bumblebee, Bombus citrinus here, um, two of the more common color patterns. Um, and it also indicates which species are in decline, um, which ones are um, considered threatened under IUCN. And then Bombus affinis here is listed as federally listed. I've roughly grouped them by color pattern. So if there's red or a rusty color on your um, bumblebee, you might refer to this left column to distinguish it. Um, if there is, um, if T3 through 5 is black, you might look over here. Um, so just generally trying to group them by color in order to distinguish these species. Um, as part of this guide, there are some general tips for how to distinguish these species, including some tips, although it's hard to see here, I apologize about that, for distinguishing some of the trickier species. So. Um, Bombus uh, vegans versus, which is the half black bumblebee versus um, Bombus sandersoni, which is uh, the Sanderson bumblebee have different cheek links, but otherwise look very, very similar. And then the American bumblebee, Bombus pennsylvanicus and the, and the black and gold bumblebee, Bombus oricomus um, have different um, uh, hairstyles. Um, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the most common bumblebees that you're likely to see, and this will sort of eliminate and help you narrow down some of the rarer ones as they come by. Um, probably far and away, the most likely one you are to see is the common Eastern bumblebee. It has a black face, a yellow vertex or top of the head, um, and then uh, uh, tends to be a black dot in the center of the thorax, which is all yellow otherwise. The first abdominal tergite, T1, is yellow, but the rest are black. Um, these species are very common. They're commercially reared. They're sometimes used um, on agricultural sites to pollinate things like blueberries or um, greenhouse uh, tomatoes. Um, so we see quite a few of them. Another very common one is the two-spotted bumblebee, um, Bombus bimaculatus. Uh, black face, yellow vertex, again a yellow thorax, which tends to have a black circle in the center. Um, the key marker for this species is that on your T2, that second abdominal segment there, there will be those two spots that make its name, which tend to form a yellow W shape, um, which will other otherwise be black um, elsewhere on that segment. Another common one is the brown belted bumblebee. This time the vertex is black, the face is black, yellow thorax again, black circle in the center. The key thing for this one is that on T2, there tends to be a brown patch in the center with black on the edges. Um, 
compare this later to the rusty patch bumblebee, where that rusty patch will be amidst yellow instead of in a matrix with black. I'll show you what that looks like. Um, they tend to have short, even hair, that kind of buzz cut look that I mentioned earlier. Another one that you might see, although I'll note that this species is in decline and is a species of conservation concern, is uh, Bombus pennsylvanicus, the American bumblebee. Um, black face, black top of the head. Um, the, there is a prominent black stripe between the wings and the side of the thorax underneath the wings will be black. Um, on the abdomen, that first abdominal segment, that T1 will often be half black, half yellow, which you can see super clearly in the photo on the right. T2 through, through three will be yellow and T4 through six will be black. And again, um, it, it, it's not necessarily uncommon to see, but the species is in, in decline and has um, declined uh, quite rapidly in the past few years. So any sighting of this is still exciting. Um, remember that this one from that little cheat sheet earlier is very similar to the black and gold uh, bumblebee. And the way to distinguish this um, is that uh, Bombus, uh, oh, I might have this mixed up, Bombus pennsylvanicus, I believe has black hairs uh, on the head and then um, black and gold bumble bumblebee will have that kind of ridge of yellow, essentially kind of a mohawk of yellow on the back of its head. There's some other little things like looking at Bombus oricomus in the field, I've noticed that they tend to look a little boxier um, uh, and you might get a sense of other small things to clue you into what's Bombus uh, oricomus. But when taking pictures of these, if you're not sure, just make sure to get a good photo of the top of the head to get that gold versus black um, distinguishing these two species. And again, the, the Pennsylvanicus will tend to have that half black, half yellow uh, on T1 compared to the black and gold bumblebee. Um, and then I wanted to bring this one uh, to your attention. It's unlikely you're going to see this one, but it's important, I think, that you know what it looks like. Um, we're not in a high potential zone for this bee, and if it does occur somewhere, it's probably in the mountains currently. Um, but um, just have it on your radar. The rusty patch bumblebee is federally listed as endangered. It has a black face, black vertex. Uh, mostly yellow thorax, and then really key is that the workers will have this yellow T2 with a rusty patch here, um, which the queens likely lack, but you can see it pretty striking, strikingly on this worker here. If you see one, that's super exciting. If you see one of these, e email me directly. <laughs> you don't need to wait for me to process it on Bumblebee Watch. Um, some resources for getting to know your bumblebees. Um, there's Bumblebees of North America, which um, one of the co-authors on this is one of our colleagues, Leif Richardson, which is a great source for learning about the variation within species of these different species. Um, there's this good resource here, uh, somewhat out of date, but still good uh, Bumblebees of the Eastern United States, um, released by the uh, Forest Service USDA. Um, on Xerces website, we have this pocket guide to identifying the rusty patch bumblebee, which will have some tips for distinguishing it from other species. If you're interested in learning more about your other bees and other insects, a great resource is Bug Guide, which I have used all the time for identifying bugs, um, narrowing them down from ones in the field. Discover Life has some great sort of taxonomical walkthroughs to narrow down what species you're looking at. And then I'm uh, plugging my friend Hannah and um, my former um, uh, co-advisor um, Elsa Youngstead. This is the Bees of North Carolina, which will also apply to the other states, which is good if you want to um, distinguish different groups of bees in the field. Bees are notoriously difficult um, to ID to species, but this will help you give you a rough idea of what um, bees you're looking at, bumblebee or, or otherwise, down to family or genus. Um, I ran through a lot of stuff. Um, I'm glad we have five minutes for questions, but I want to acknowledge um, supporters of the Xerxes Society um, and also our partners in Tennessee, Georgia, um, and North Carolina, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We have social media sites. You can follow us, and join us on Facebook, connect with other volunteers, let us know about your adventures in the field and what you're looking at. 
Um, we're also, um, the wider Atlas is on Instagram at Bumblebee Atlas and on Twitter at Bumblebee Atlas. Um, and with that, we have time for some questions. Thanks, Lori. That's great. Um, I have typed answers to most of the questions um, in the Q&A. Uh, there's one question lingering here that is too hard to answer by typing. So I thought it'd be worth handling live. Um, Laura asks, I have a male persimmon tree. Um, it is covered in bumblebees when in bloom. I could easily spend 45 minutes catching bumblebees on just that one tree. But should I? Is it better to sample from a variety of plants? Uh, you probably have an answer in mind for that already, Rich, but I would encourage folks when you're choosing your sites to walk around and try to cover as much of your hectare as you can to collect off a variety of plants. And that'll give an indication of what plants in the landscape are actually being used. Rich, do you have additional thoughts on that? Um, first of all, I'm sorry for my backlighting here. I look like a, a ghost. I see that. And I'm sorry about that. And, uh, <laughs> skylight in this room and the light just has gone back and forth. So I apologize for that. But um, yeah, I, I would agree that we want, you would want to spend a fair bit of time sampling on that tree and, and getting a, uh, a decent survey of the bees that are, that are visiting it. So, you know, if you know your bumblebees, I would be, you know, to try to capture maybe 10 of lookalike species and then and then capture for diversity after that. But really to, to you wanna get through your whole plot. And, and um, the real goal of this project is to find out what resources they're using. And, and, and it could be that only common bumblebees are going to that huge resource. And you may have a rare species that are going to flowers that, that aren't as showy. And so we really wanna to try to to get around through the whole plot and take advantage of uh, and survey all the plants that are out there. So, um, and if you know if you walk through that whole site and you don't see a whole nother bumblebee, you're welcome to go back to that tree and and then again you know survey for diversity. But yeah, we wouldn't want to spend our whole 45 minutes um, capturing off just one tree. Um, but but it's a really good question. It's also can be very hard to sample from the tops of trees. I don't know how tall your persimmon tree is, but um, that's another challenge. <laughs> but yeah, great question and, and thanks for asking it. Yeah, thank you. We have another question in the chat here about the sheer size of the 50 by 50 kilometer grids and um, the fact that it's several thousand hectares and does each grid cell have a coordinator? Um, yeah, that's a great point. It's a wide area and the, and the, the way that we consider um, the grid cell to have, have been surveyed within a season is just two of those surveys within that grid cell, anywhere within that grid cell. And that's our way of spreading out our survey efforts as much as possible. Um, uh, if you find that there are other volunteers in your survey, you may like to coordinate with them to make sure you're not going to the same sites. Um, but otherwise, I don't think we found uh, overlap to be a huge issue given the size, the, the size of the, the area that we're working with. But it's certainly, you, you should hopefully within that 50 by 50 kilometer grid cell have choices for places to do your two, two surveys. Um, another question out here, do we, are we able to survey the, in cells that we have not adopted or should we stick to our adopted grid cells? Say yes, right, Rich? As long as you, right? Yeah, I would encourage folks to be opportunistic. And if you're traveling and feel like you have the time and space to do a survey, you know, and you have the permits and permissions to do so wherever you are, we would encourage you to do that. Um, we just ask folks to, to adopt the grid cells where they're going to commit to doing two. But if you're going to do opportunistic surveys throughout the region, we, we would definitely encourage you to do that. Um, and likewise, if you want to adopt more than one grid cell, you can do that. You can adopt as many as you'd like, um, as long as you really feel like you can reasonably commit to, to the requirements of the project. Cool. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, um, I, I think the grid cells are essentially a tool for us to spread out our efforts as much as possible, but more data 
um, is always welcome. Um, I saw some comments about safety concerning copperheads, ticks. I would say chiggers as well. Be mindful of where you're going to survey. Um, you might find that you like uh, want to have those things that cover your your boots. Um, yeah, just keep your safety in mind. Be mindful of the other wildlife in that area. Um, and with that, we're at we're at 8 p.m. I want to um, thank you all so much for joining us. I want to remind you that our um, field season this year will start May 15th. Um, please be signed up on the um, Southeast Bumblebee Atlas um, on our mailing list so you can get updates concerning upcoming field events, um, uh, permitting, um, things like that, useful info, um, but also don't hesitate to reach out to me with any questions. And thank you so much for your time. And this will be available on the resources website and on the Xerces YouTube page and post, and you will be notified about that. Thank you. For those that are still here, there are some questions about um, about can you survey more than twice in a grid cell? And I would say that yes, that that is definitely our sort of minimum ask. But um, you know, ideally, we would probably have, from a biological perspective, we would probably have a lot more asks in terms of how many times we would want to survey. So yeah, two is the minimum. But really, as many surveys as you want to do is great within a grid cell. Um, and if you're going to be surveying the same location, we usually recommend that separating those by at least three weeks um, in time. So, so if you're surveying your own property, like surveying every three weeks would really give you a good um, picture of the phenology of the different species that emerge through time. So, so that would do it. I also saw a question about whether folks could have time to read through the Q&A. Um, We'll stay on here for maybe another minute, but we, we will record the Q&A and we, we will send it out as a PDF or a link for all for everybody to to read through afterwards just so you'll have these resources um, in the future, um, along with the recording of this of this video. Um. Another good question in here about will the survey participants receive receive the results? Do you want to talk about that, Laurie? Sure. Yeah. At the conclusion of the field season, after I've done a little bit of data processing, yes, you will receive um, a summary of what we've discovered uh, this year and, and be um, kept uh, abreast of, of all our hard work. So yes, um, if you're on that mailing list uh, in contact, yes, you will receive a summary. Um, Is that, is that sufficient? Um, we, we also have a question here about um, centrifuge tubes on the, um, on the resource page. I include some links and also on the participant handbook, I include a link for smaller, more manageable orders of centrifuge tubes, not hundreds and hundreds. So um, there, um, there are smaller shipments available. Yeah, and I would also encourage you to go to like craft stores, like. Well, in the West Coast, we have a store called Michael's that has all kinds of craft supplies. We have Michael's. You have Michael's, okay. Um, yeah, including little plastic screw top jars. And you know, you can also use baby food jars or old um, spice jars, lots of different options out there for you. Don't feel like you, you certainly don't need to buy that many of them and you certainly don't need to spend that amount of money. You should be able to find them on some large national <laughs> retail websites for. Ten or fifteen dollars should be about all you would need to spend. Also, I'll be uh, I'll be giving them out at the in person events, um, kind of like Johnny Appleseed with files. So um, I will <laughs> I I have hundreds in my apartment, so I will have those with me. 